All right, it is March 27th, 2023, and we're here at Faciation Space. Thank you, Mike, for hosting um, for Human Design Catalyst. And today uh, we have a newcomer. Thanks, Sophia, for joining us. Yes. You can kind of wave on the screen if you want to. That's <laughs> her hand here, I believe. Um, and we have a couple other relatively new folks as well. So what we're, we're, we're going to start uh, doing more foundational material when we have new people. And so today we're going to talk about generators. And the idea here is, um, you know, we had Danny, uh, you know, come but about a month ago. That's Danny. <laughs> and he, uh, he happened to come in on the substructure according to Steve Rhodes class, which is not really a very easy introduction to human design. In fact, it wasn't human design. It was Steve Rhodes material. So we just kind of figured, let's make sure people get their foundations. And it's always, always fun, always good to go over basics again. So we're basically going to be talking about type. Um, in future times, we may, you know, if we find that we're talking too much about type, we may go on to profile and so on. But today, I just want to talk about generators. And uh, we can talk about the manifesting generator as well. Uh, maybe, maybe save that for a second portion because it's a little bit controversial and there's some other aspects. Or maybe just as we go, we, we might want to do that. Silence your phones, everyone, please. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I, I just want to start talking about type. So first of all, when we say type, what do we mean in human design? Um, you know, what is type? Uh, people, like I've been asking ChatGPT, and you know, it says human design is a personality typing system. It's not. Myers-Briggs is a personality typing system. Enneagram is a personality typing yeah. system. Human design is a little different. When we say type, what we're referring to is the aura. Mm. The aura type. Mm. And so to talk about type, we can't really talk about type without starting with aura. And all of us have auras. Um, as a general rule of thumb, if you stick out your outstretched arm, you know, your aura extends roughly one more outstretched arm length past your outstretched arm. Uh, it can go further. I mean, it's not, that's not a hard rule. Mm. Um, I remember I have a friend in high school who went to a... a Ravi Shankar concert, and he had taken some psychedelics, and he could see auras in this state, and said that Ravi Shankar's aura was filling up the whole room, and was actually like merging with different auras of different musicians, and they were interacting and coming together in a sort of a misty confluence. So I don't want people to think that your aura is only an arm's length beyond your extended arm, but you can do aura experiments, and that's actually one of the fun things that I did in my, probably my second year of human design, but my first year of really um, going public with it. Mm. And I, I, I actually had a really fun experiment, uh, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, because I'm a generator. And so part of the human design experiment is also an aura experiment. What happens when your aura does the talking? Mm. What happens when you observe what the aura does without you, your personality, doing anything? Mm. Um, but, you know, aura experiments are definitely one of the joys of the discovery of this knowledge because it's something you can, you can witness, you can do, you can get results with, and you can just have a lot of fun with and the different kinds of auras. So when we talk about type, uh, there are the four main types, and then I guess generator is, is split between generator and manifesting generator. And there's a controversy around whether the auras are different. Uh, I think obviously they are, but there's also different kinds of projector auras, and there's different <laughs> an emotional manifestor aura is different than a splenic or an ego manifestor aura, and so on. Um, so obviously, uh, it's kind of splitting hairs about is the difference at the level of the four types, or is it the difference at the level of subtype? It doesn't really matter to me. Um, there's a w nice symmetry with four types and the four um, bases that have... The, I guess the four diagrams, which are yin and yang combination, that is there's yang-yang mm -hmm. manifester, yin-yin generator, and then yin-yang and yang-yin, which are combinations of the two, which would be the projector and the reflector. So there's a nice mm -hmm. symmetry between the yin and yang diagrams, as they're called, any pair of two lines, kind of like binary code, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. Well, there's four types, and there's kind of these four fundamental building blocks that we can decompose any hexagram into. Mm -hmm. But then there's also five bases. There's a fifth base, which doesn't have a diagram, mm -hmm. the base of space. And so um, 
Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on this, Mike, or just want to keep it keep it rolling? Uh, keep it rolling. Let's okay. See, yeah. Okay. So the generator manifesting generator thing, we can just kind of table. Suffice it to say, there's obviously a difference in aura. Uh, in our conversation last week with Mark Germain, he was saying that he actually feels the manifesting generator aura slower and heavier, like a steamroller, mm -hmm. compared to the generator. That's funny because we usually say the generator is like a turtle. And the manifesting generator is the hair. Mm. So you would think it's actually quick and sprightly, and we actually usually think of the generator as the kind of slow-moving type. But again, some of this is kind of like asking, what is an elephant really like? And there's the blind men, and they're all describing the elephant, and one is grabbing its trunk, and the other is grabbing its tail, and they're going to give you very different descriptions. Mm -hmm. So depending on what we have access to and what we see ourselves from our own view and our own you know, relatively differentiated or not perspective, we will, um, yeah, we're, we're going to have different, uh, so I just want to make sure that, that we're all good here. Okay, so in any case, um, there are four fundamental types, five if we include the manifesting generator. So, and these types are basically different types of auras. Um, the generator, which is the one that we're going to really spend the most time talking about, uh, is a large enveloping aura, and so is the manifesting generator aura. Even with, that, with, with the differences, however the differences are, it's still their commonality that they share that they don't share with any other type, the generator and the manifesting generator. And also, by the way, many of the websites will tell manifesting generators, or it'll say your manifesting generator type, um, Ra was actually careful to distinguish the only true manifesting generator has the channel 3420, mm -hmm. the channel of charisma, where thoughts become deeds, where thoughts become actions. Mm -hmm. And that is the direct connection of the sacral center to the throat, and that is the true manifesting generator because it's a manifestor channel, but they're a generator because they have the defined sacral. Mm -hmm. Every other generator that, that is listed as a manifesting generator that doesn't have that channel is at, technically, according to Ra, a generator with manifesting potential. Mm. Mm. So we just say manifesting generator because it's a lot easier and quicker, and it's just kind of, oh yeah, I'm an MG or I'm a G, I'm a generator, I'm a manifesting generator. Okay, sure. But technically speaking, there is a difference there as well. But the commonality, regardless of generator or generator with manifesting potential or manifesting generator, these are big <coughs> enveloping auras that can fill a room. These are auras that are like getting a bear hug. You know, these are auras that uh, two generators can sit on a park bench next to each other and say more to each other through their aura than if they were actually talking across the room mm -hmm. with words. Mm -hmm. Because the actual energetic uh, information that is passed between them is so strong. And because 70% of the world is a generator or a manifesting generator, um, you know, the auras of the world tend to be predominantly the generator aura. Of course, we know in human design, if you don't have a center defined, you amplify that center. Mm -hmm. So even the projectors and the manifestors and the reflectors are going around amplifying that sacral energy. Um, I was at the, the dance party on Saturday. You were there briefly. I mean, dance parties are total generator events. Projectors join in, manifestors join in. Yeah, you were there as well. You joined in. But I mean, you're all kind of thriving off of or amplifying that sacral or sacral buzz. People pronounce it either way. Ra tend to say sac sacral. Uh, I often say sacral because I think it is also the sacred life force energy mm -hmm. of the planet. It is the life force oh. energy itself. So, welcome, welcome. Hi. Some noise, some noise Hello. just came from there. I think that's this little, this little guy. Hello. So. <laughs> Alright, we can wait a minute. Get a chair. So for projectors especially, um, and we'll talk about their type in a moment, um, they're, they tend to really get the sacral buzz. Manifestors and reflectors do as well, and they talk about being burned out from having this activated sacral center. Um, 
Ra, as a manifester, talked about he had a long-term Pluto transit activating his route to a sacral system and you know, it lasted for years and it really led to a bit of a sacral or, or sacral burnout. But well, we'll talk about them in a minute, but the reason that projectors are especially vulnerable is that for projectors like the generators, they primarily amplify and are conditioned by each other's auras and by manifestor and reflector auras. Mm. Uh, manifestors and reflectors are primarily conditioned by the transits, by the, by the neutrino field, which is to say the current planetary conditions. So you'll notice um, you can take two charts and put them together, or if you don't have software that can do this, you can just get one chart and get the other and kind of put them in two separate tabs or open them both at the same time and go back and forth between them. And that's called partnership analysis. You'll see how one person has half a channel, they have a you know, hanging gate, the other person has the harmonic hanging gate. Mm -hmm. Together it makes that whole channel. Well, when that happens, we have activation of centers in some cases, and we, we amplify either the new center that's created together or the other center that the person has, and so on. Well, generators and projectors are going to primarily amplify and take in energy from people. Manifestors and reflectors, it's primarily from the transits. Because the other thing you can do is you can look at the current planetary positions and what gates are activated currently. And then you can superimpose that over your chart. So really we have two different ways of being conditioned. And for generators and projectors, we're primarily amplifying each other and, and manifestors and you know, reflectors. Um, and dogs and cats and other, other living beings. And then we're secondarily amplifying the background frequency. Um, well, that's kind of a technical term in human design. I would say the transits, the transits. For manifestors and reflectors, they primarily amplify the transits. So it really is an interesting thing how they have a primary relationship to the cosmos and only a secondary relationship to each other. Mm. So the generator has this, this huge enveloping aura that is essentially sharing information with, conditioning and being conditioned by, sponging, absorptive. Um, it's always interesting. People who have a defined solar plexus often think they can hide their emotions. <laughs> Maybe if they're manifestors. Manifestors have, have a dense aura. and We'll kind of go to, to them in a moment. Um, but the, you know, the, the generator is wearing their emotions on their sleeve if they're emotionally defined because their aura is so open and so enveloping that you can really feel it and get a sense of it. And if you have an undefined solar plexus, you're going to naturally synchronize to that. Um, you're going to amplify it, sometimes to the point of distortion. You're going to take it in and there's no real... There's no real choice of the mind to say, I'm going to open or close my aura. Um, you might try some, something. You might try to do... A, I mean, I think, I think you know, people do. There are, um, there are kind of fundamental differences between people, for instance, who are nose breathers or mouth breathers. And I think that if you're naturally a nose breather, then your aura is opening when you're nose breathing and you're closing a little more when you mouth breathe and vice versa. But despite some of these nuances of how we might open or close our aura, if you're a generator, you can never really close it. You can't just like, mm, I'm closing my aura right now. You know, you can't just close your eyes and say, I'm shutting down from this. <laughs> you can try to disconnect from the person. You can ignore them. You can do, I mean, you can do certain things, but you can't really, you're still taking in the energy. Mm -hmm. In fact, Ra would say, don't spend time with someone that you wouldn't eat like in a cannibalistic situation, because you basically are eating their aura. So it's something to realize, uh, and especially for generators and projectors. So we're going to talk mainly about generators. I want to cover the other aura types, and then I'll return to generators, and I'll talk about my early aura experiments of when I first got into human design. Probably my second year, and I began to kind of go public with it and, and how, how that occurred. But first, we'll just go through the types. So if you're a generator, a manifesting generator, a generator with manifesting potential, you have this wide open enveloping aura. If you're a projector, you have a focused aura. And it's very different to have a focused aura. 
when the projector is looking at you, depending on how focused on you they are, it can actually feel very uncomfortable, especially if it's not invited. It's kind of like x-ray vision. It's like, I don't want you to see me naked. What are you looking at? You know, the, the projector can burrow a hole in the person that they're looking at. Um, hmm. And I'll talk about the OR experiments in a minute, but one of the interesting things we did was uh, we had an event where we had about 50 people. There was actually a follow-up to the first one where we just did some human design readings. And so the second one, people already kind of knew their designs, and we had a friend who had a laminator and had printed out full color and kind of laminated charts for everyone. And a few hours into it, we, we split off into rooms. The generators and the manifesting generators all went into one room. The projectors went in the other. The manifestors, I think there were only two of them there, nobody tells them what to do, they just did whatever they want. And there was one reflector there who we just kind of allowed to observe whatever. <laughs> so, uh, but the generators were all in one room, the projectors another. What we would do is, we would send one generator into the projector room. They would spend five minutes in there with all the projectors, then they would bring a projector back to the generator room, I guess we would do it at the same time. So there would always be one generator in the projector room. They would tag team or trade out. They would kind of tap out. And then after five or 10 minutes, they would switch rooms and trade. So there would be one generator in the room full of projectors, one projector in the room full of generators. Okay, well, the generators have this big enveloping aura. 20 generators in the room, there's, there's 25 things going on. You know, there's more things than there are people going on because each generator, is, especially the manifesting generators, are doing multiple things and it's bouncing around and they're, they're laughing and talking. Unfortunately, most of them did not notice when the projectors came or left. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. So the projectors maybe didn't get as much out of this as the generators did. They're like, this is normal life. This is just normal life for me. This is just me at a cafe being ignored. You know, the, case, right? the generators, on the other hand, reported walking into a room where people were having nice, quiet conversation, and then suddenly, everyone turns. And looks right at them, <laughs> like deer in the headlights. You know, all, just burrowing a hole in the, the generator. And you know, one generator said, oh, it's the biggest ego trip I ever had. I mean, like, was, like, paying attention to me. They were all kind of, you know, it's like... The, the thing is that the projectors... Um, I mean, the projector-generator relationship is very special, but the interesting thing is, oftentimes, because the projectors lack the sacral energy they will kind of be at the whims or mercy of the generator to a degree. Not always, but to a degree. Um, the other example of this is there was an immersion that I heard of led by Mary Ann Winnegar. And she does these very interesting aura experiments, type experiments, that last a week. They last multiple days. And she did one where on the first day, she said, okay, everyone, put on your name tags for your type, you know, manifestors, generators, projectors, reflectors, and here's the rules. Manifestors can approach and strike up a conversation with anyone they want to. Generators can strike up a conversation with anyone but manifestors. Projectors can strike up a conversation with each other and reflectors, and reflectors are here to be initiated with, to have others approach them. Just observe, take notes, and then if you're asked, you know, what have you been observing, or if you're invited, or if you're, you know drawn on as a resource. Now the thing is, reflectors actually don't have a hard time with this because they tend to be pretty in demand. People want reflectors around. People bring, bring them in quite a bit. It's the projectors who have a harder time with it. They really do. And so in this case, um, as I'd heard the story, the projector said, okay, well the first day, the projectors are like, okay, nice experiment. By the third day, they're ready to leave. What am I doing paying all this money to come here and I just sit around and nobody talks to me? Well, you can talk to each other. Projectors aren't as interested talking to each other. You said when, when projectors meet, it's like the teacher's lounge. Mm. Oh, you know, how are your generators doing? Oh, they're kind of having a hard time. How are your generators? They're doing a little better. You know, the, the, the projectors are outnumbered four to one by generators. It's a generator world, and the generators tend to have this sacral energy to actually get stuff done in the world in a, in a significant way that projectors amplify, but sometimes to their, uh, you know, to, you know, uh, deleterious effects. If the projector is trying to compete to be a generator, to try to out-generator that generator, and they end up burning out and working too hard and so on. But in any case, for this experiment, the projectors are all sitting around talking to each other. Did you get invited? No, no one's talking to me. No, all those generators, ah, it's the third day in a row, they're all going out to lunch, they're all going out, they're just palling around. It's like the generators are just this big gaggle of, of geese and just, you know, waves crashing over each other and just 
just bouncing around and the projectors are kind of ignored. Because I think generators also sometimes can intuitively be careful about inviting projectors because it can be a give an inch, take a mile thing. They're where so I've heard stories from generators <laughs> saying, oh yeah, I invited my old friend and then I invited another friend and, and my projector friend was mad. It's usually when there's two projectors. <laughs> Was, was mad at me that I didn't have enough time for them. <laughs> but I didn't think that I had to spend all this time with them just by inviting them. I said, hey, why don't you come with me? I didn't know I was signing up to, you know, host, host the projector and to basically <laughs> kind of be there for them every minute to kind of... But, you know, it really depends on the projector as well because projectors are the most varied of all types. And a tribal projector is going to have a very different requirement than a logical <laughs> or an individual projector and so on, different profiles. Mm -hmm. That gets into the whole projector mechanic of invitation, and the projector has to know that that a linguistic verbal invitation is not the same if someone is not holding space. It's really the investment of energy in the hosting of you once you show up. That's an actual invitation, and that's always going to come along automatically if you're actually being seen and invited. But if someone's just saying, I want you to come to this thing, but they're not expecting yeah, they might want 50 people to come there, and they want you to be one of 50 people, exactly. and they're not inviting you. It's like, what are they inviting you for? And I, I tend to say the real invitation is a carte blanche invitation to essentially take charge, mm -hmm. inviting the projector to be the boss, mm -hmm. inviting the projector to kind of decide what does and doesn't happen, and to decide or at least have a say in or a dominating, overriding say in what happens, when does it happen, what are the logistics, division of labor, we should we move this over there, do we do this instead of this? I mean, really, the projector is kind of meant to be invited. But see, the thing is, if a generator is inviting multiple projectors, recipe for disaster. Mm. Ra would say projectors can use the three-person group as a signpost they're in the wrong place. Mm. If they find themselves in an extended period of time with two other people, and I was just telling you this the other night, um, mm. that is a signpost that they have taken a wrong turn somewhere. Mm. And if you're a projector and you're with two other people, one of them will end up hating you. You know, because you're going to only pay attention to the other. Now, if you're with a larger group, it works a little bit differently, and that, that can work. But when you're just with two other people, and each of them are hoping to get quality time, uh, you end up getting quality time with one, and the other feels like chopped liver. And it's an energetic thing. Because bringing it back to the aura, the projector aura burrows in with its X-ray vision and burrows right into the G-center, right to the magnetic monopole, the deepest center of identity, love, and direction of the other person. And if they're not expecting it, they can freak out. I mean, I've seen Ray change people's lives in two minutes as a projector, <laughs> burrowing into their G-center. Just the way you look at them. Just the way you phrase something. I mean, just the question you ask them. Projectors often guide by asking questions. And it's not that the question has an answer. Is that the question turns the generator's direction just so slightly. Uh, there was a great inventor named Buckminster Fuller, R. Buckminster Fuller, and on his gravestone he had etched, Call me trim tab. The trim tab is a very small piece of a boat, sometimes very large ships even, and it's this small piece that turns the rudder. And so if the trim tab turns ever so slightly, that boat ends up a thousand miles in a different place mm -hmm. over, the, over its journey. And that's what projectors can do. They can, they're the trim tabs of the world. You can just slightly switch the direction that that generator is going. Mm -hmm. um, but their aura is penetrating, having a penetrating aura. That can be, uh, you know, it's like get consent first, you know. Ask the generator, do, do you want me to tell you what I really think? And, yeah, please, please tell me. You really want to know? Uh-huh. Do you really want to know? Uh -huh. Okay, then, then they get it. But, you know, make sure that it's, it's, it's in that way. But so just looking at the aura dynamics. So at, uh, and, and, you know, by the way, to kind of wrap up the, you know, immersion, by day three, the projectors were uh, mutinying mm -hmm. and were, you know, why did I pay all this money to come here to just be told I can't talk to anyone and I have to wait for them to talk to me and I just have to sit around and kind of wait to be invited? Well, by day five, they're getting the invitations and they're on top of the world because they're authentic invitations. Mm -hmm. Because guess what? Those first three days, if they were tagging along with the generators, they would have felt just as bitter. They would have felt just as ignored. They would have felt just as... as unneeded and, and as, you know, th that's, this is the bitterness of the projectors. What am I even doing here? I have so much to offer that's pearls before swine. Mm 
And the generators are the swine, right? So, <laughs> I mean, that's, this, that's the way it is. There's four generators for every projector. They're outnumbered. So the experiment, the you know, immersion from what I heard was actually a huge success because by enforcing the type mechanics, mm -hmm. it was a sort of fake it till you make it where, you know, let's see what happens. Even if, even if you're using your mind to control the situation and go against what you would normally naturally do. Well, I don't trust what people would naturally do. You can make just as many mental decisions naturally, reactively through your conditioning. It's actually nice to... Um, this is kind of like our conversation the other day about should and should anyone use should or not and all this stuff. And, and I mean, to me, it doesn't really matter. It's what gets you to witness the aura mechanics to the point where once you see it, you can't unsee it. Mm -hmm. That's what learning is. There are some things that only experience can teach. Yeah. You have to experience it and then you know it. And then you'll never not know it. Mm -hmm. And that's what the aura mechanics are like. Once you've seen how they work, you can't unsee them. Um, so in that case of a kind of forced, contrived experiment, well, the, the contrivance led to the authenticity later because it was contrived, but then after that, the projectors could see, okay, when I was forced to not start up a conversation with people, eventually somebody started a conversation with me, and I would have got to that exact same place, but I would have just been wasting all my energy talking their ear off on deaf ears for days before. Because they weren't ready to invite me. They didn't invite me. They would have invited me around the same time anyway. It took four or five days of chilling with my aura before they wanted to invite me. And if all I was doing was approaching person after person saying, are you going to invite me? And look at all I know and look at how much advice I can give. And it would have just been a waste of energy. A total waste. Mm -hmm. So it, it comes around anyway. I mean, the aura does the talking. It's just a matter of what you're going to do while you wait. Are you just going to waste a bunch of energy spinning out trying to get an invitation? It's, it's going to come around anyway. The people that are going to invite you will invite you anyway. They probably wanted to invite you the moment they saw you, but they were waiting to kind of see how you move through the world. And it's not like you can really screw it up either. I mean, it's like, even if the projector is the most annoying person in the world and going in around initiating with everyone, they're still going to get the same invitation five days later. Because the person who likes their energy is still going to like their energy, whether they're being annoying or not. They just like their energy. It's like, that's the thing to realize is that it kind of just funnels into the same place. So the generator has this big absorbing aura. The projector has this penetrating, precise, needlepoint, laser, laser pointer aura. The manifester has a repelling aura. Interesting, we don't get a lot of manifestors here. They kind of drop in sometimes. But manifestors, Ra said that manifestors were the least interested in human design. <laughs> I, I tend to find that true as well. Statistically, we get about the number of manifestors. Well, actually, no, we, we get more than, we get maybe double the general population, but maybe not, because it's about 9%. And looking at the 100 people who come to the High Desert Human Design Conference, you know, it's probably, I think we actually get around the percentage you would expect. Mm. Whereas we get far more than the no normal amount of reflectors, far more than normal projectors, far less than normal generators. So I would say manifestors statistically seem to have the le least interest, followed by generators who have a less than average interest, projectors have a more than average interest, and so do reflectors. Mm -hmm. That's what I found. We had seven reflectors out of 100 people last year. That's seven times what you would expect statistically. We had maybe nine manifestors, if that, which is around what you'd expect. And then we had probably 40 projectors, which is around double. And then probably half as many generators as you'd expect, mm -hmm. or less. So maybe we had triple projectors even. With we experience. really should do, do the numbers on it. Maybe this year we can do the numbers. But, but it's just interesting to see that, in general, <laughs> some types um, are more interested in human design or not. Projectors, you know, they tend to be more interested because it's a system and they can master the system and they tend to succeed when they have mastery of systems. Generators tend to be less interested, I think, because they have their little respite of satisfaction that allows them to put up with a lot of frustration. So they might be in a job they hate, they might be in a dead-end relationship, they might be in all of these places where they're struggling and frustrated, but they have game night. Or they have, you know, their sports, or they have their six-pack of beer, or they have, you know, whatever crutch it is that's a... Usually it's sex. Sex or food or some kind of thing or some competitive thing, or it really depends. This gets into the Steve Rhodes stuff, you know. They have that thing that puts them in a good mood that allows them to put up with all the frustration in the world. Mm -hmm. 
so they don't really think that there's anything else. They have so much PTSD that they're expecting frustration from everything that they just don't really believe that anything could actually help. So they don't really have a lot of interest in human design because you come along and say, this can help you generators be less frustrated. And they go, yeah, whatever. Everyone tells that's going to frustrate me. <laughs> it's going to lead to more frustration. It's not, you know, that's, just a, that's just a trick. It's like, uh, you know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, like Linus and Lucy, or I guess Charlie Brown and, you know, Lucy, all generators are expecting that ball to be pulled out right when they kick. Mm -hmm. in a generator way they, uh, they, they don't believe it's possible to really have any lasting satisfaction it's really sad actually <laughs> so but the manifestor yeah <laughs> but then a, a projector you know a, a an unwitting generator finds themselves at a party and they walk into a room with Robert Ray doing a tarot swirl and their life changes forever that little trim tab you know? <laughs> they see him two years later and say wow that reading stuck with me you know? <laughs> <laughs> the unwitting generator finds a, a you know projector and has the openness to be able to receive what that projector has to offer, which is what it's really about. Mm -hmm. So the manifester has a repelling aura, and the repelling aura essentially can observe other people's auras, but it tends to play with its own uh, cards close to the vest, so to speak. So the manifester tells you how much they value you, and you go, really? I never knew that, because it's... It's hard to tell, you know, they can be hard to read. They have a dense, Raw did a lecture to a room full of manifestors, and he said he would never do that again because they were the most repressed group. Mm. Repressed. Mm. It's interesting to think of repression in the psychological sense, the Freudian sense, like being a little uptight, being a little too formal, or being a little too, uh, just a little, just not really comfortable. I mean, certainly some manifestors seem comfortable in their own skin, and some of them seem like they're sexually liberated and they're liberated in other ways and they certainly don't seem repressed. But there is, I can see why Ra would say that. Because I think what he's trying to get across with that repression is some description of what that dense aura is, feels like. I mean, Ra said he loved being at a party and watching people walk up to manifestors. Like a really, really like, you know, attractive person at a party who also is a manifestor. Watching the people walk up to them and try to kind of get in their aura, and then just get bounced right off. They walk up and they go, hey, how's it going? Uh, yeah, okay, well, good to see you. And they just keep going. You know, they just, they can't. It's like, how long can they stay in that person's aura? Not very long. I've seen manifestors uh, sit down, and then all the people that were talking around them just moved from another area, just move away from them. It's like they just have this invisible dense cloud that pushes people away. Mm. Bon, bon to right? He's a generator, but he certainly <laughs> does push people away. He certainly does. But you know what? You can tell he's, he's a generator, a, a generator with manifesting potential, because despite how much he tries to push people away, mm. no matter how much he does, people, he's always complaining that like clockwork, people will take his seat or they'll come sit down next to him, or they'll come and say, hey, what are you, what's that you're working on? Or they'll, I mean, it's just they're always, it's like he can't get away from them. He has this magnetic aura. That's the other part of the generator aura, is that it's really magnetic. It draws people in. It pulls people towards them. The manifestor is not drawing things in. They're essentially pushing people out of the way. So they're taking people's places. They're, you know, getting people to leave so they can kind of, they're pushing their way through the crowd orically. Um, Ra likened the manifester to uh, a car going down the street and it's going faster than the other cars and it wants all the other cars to get out of the way. And it's not correct for them to slow down. It's not correct for them to get stuck behind all the other cars. Mm -hmm. They're meant to be constantly passing people and constantly, really not even passing, just making others get out of their way. Mm -hmm. um, but that is the informing. He said, you know, you have some you know, little old lady crossing the street with... With her, uh, you know, and the manifestor shouldn't shouldn't slow down, but they can at least honk the horn and say, "Get out of the way!" <laughs> As they're coming, you know, that's what the manifestor does, and people do, people do. And then finally, there's the reflector and and the reflector aura, and that's called the Teflon aura, because it's really a sampling aura that is here to sample all of the different auras and kind of see what they're like, but not take anything with them. So the reflector can be sitting with someone and they can both be crying and having a deep emotional experience. And then the other person can leave and the reflector can be like, okay, what's for dinner? 
Like they, they don't really carry unless there's a transit going on, in which case they're going to be, you know, crying their eyes out from that transit. The reflector has a primary relationship to the transits. Mm -hmm. And so they can either be a cacophony of different voices shouting for attention of the nine different centers. You know, Ra in his encounter with, with the, the voice said at one point he actually heard his nine centers talking to him. Mm -hmm. It was a really trippy experience where they each had their own personality and they were each kind of anthropomorphized and so on. Very scary experience. So the reflector, as the not-self, can be amplifying all nine centers to the point of distortion to where there are cacophonous medley of screaming voices, screaming in pain, or they can be a beautiful symphony. The, the symphony, the, the harmony of the spheres, this sort of symphonic expression of the higher order of the transits being expressed through them. And the difference is whether they're living their design and how deeply they are surrendered to the experiment, which is going to be basically how much they're amplifying to the point of distortion versus how much they have disidentified with their experience of their own aura to the point where they can allow the flow of energy through them without identifying with that and saying, I am this and I am that. And I am angry and I am bitter and I am frustrated and so on. Uh, so it really is, and you know, that, that's the test for each of the types is kind of how well they can surrender to allowing the mechanism of their aura to operate versus how much they are trying to mentally control it by identifying with it. But for the reflector, it is quite the challenge. It is absolutely a challenge. Um, there's a sort of kind of imagination when you come into human design that everything must be fair and that every type has its advantage and disadvantage and therefore it must be equally difficult and equally easy. Well, nothing is equal in human design. It's all hierarchies and some configurations are harder than others. I won't say across the board reflectors are harder than others. I'm sure there are some ways it's easier than others. It's easier when they realize they don't actually have to do anything. If you have a defined ego, people are making you prove things your entire life. I mean, I have a friend who's a contractor with a defined ego. They ask him for receipts. Why did it cost this much? Prove it to me. You know, <laughs> If you don't have a defined ego, you don't have to prove anything. If, if you don't have a defined throat, you don't have to get people's attention. If you don't have a defined head and ajna, you don't have to solve things. You don't have to know things, and so on. So when the reflector realizes that they actually are off the hook, they have no obligations, well, it's probably a lot easier. But the amount of reflectors that have realized that, you could probably count on one hand. Mm -hmm. Because the world that we live in does not facilitate that kind of awakening. Mm -hmm. Human design does. Mm -hmm. Human design does. Well, isn't that where the hierarchy comes in? Is the the world that we've made? Isn't I mean the hierarchy of like different people's compatibilities with the world that we've set up for ourselves? Because it's like in the natural state, in a natural world, there would be like no resistance for no matter how bizarre and apparently contradictory your design is. Because when we talk about contradictions in human design, too, they're always linguistic contradictions. It's not like your body is ever going to contradict itself. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. I mean, the, the form knows how to navigate correctly as itself. It's the fact that we had 90,000 years of an evolutionary project to become the apex predator through the use of the mind to make the best decisions every time. And now we've had 200 years roughly 230, 240 years of the mind essentially having to surrender and trust that the decision can be made by something it has never trusted. Right. Because the evolutionary project was how much can the discipline of the mind override the natural inclinations of the body to become the apex predator of the world. Now that we've achieved that, we're transitioning to this emotional awareness and this receptivity and this right variable consciousness uh, which is kind of like holistic, receptive, non-competitive, and so on. And uh, the mind is really here to be the outer authority, to be able to communicate cleanly, and to be able to witness, and to be able to essentially um, to share or to support in different ways, and so on, but only really through outer authority, whereas it is the inner authority of the person that is um, the correct navigational tool now. So, I mean, for the previous being, uh, the Homo sapiens, because we are truly Homo transitus, we're no longer Homo sapiens. We are this transitory being now, this new, it's like we evolved and nobody noticed. 
you know? <laughs> and so we're kind of in this new new interim state, mm-hmm. what we call in human design the Plutonic Interregnum, which is between the discovery of Uranus in 1781 and the ending of the current global cycle in 2027. And so we're in this Plutonic Interregnum where um, we really are getting to try out this new form that, which is not to say that there wasn't some kind of inner authority before, I'm sure there was, just that the evolutionary project was the development of the Ajna Center. And if we went from the splenic to the Ajna, now we're moving on to the solar plexus awareness. So the Ajna awareness was the name of the game, now we're moving on to the solar plexus. Cool. Say something about the 27. 2027? Yeah. I think that would be a good um, topic for a whole day, because we are a whole... Actually, many days. No. Uh, <laughs> something Ross said is that if you really study the transits, it would take a week to go into detail of just a single day's worth of transits. The transits are so deep that all we can ever really do is summarize them. But 2027, uh, February 15th, 2027, is when our current global cycle of 410 years changes. And we're in a global cycle called the cross of planning. And essentially, the background frequency of our current era is a frequency of tribal support and of collective cooperation and sharing and essentially building the big cities and building the egalitarian collectives and the Red Cross and all of the, um, just all of the big organizations. And the, the too big to fail. Well, after 2027, they fail. And so that's... It's about time. Yeah, I guess guess so. Okay, so uh, we've covered the aura types. My goal is to kind of go a little more into generators. Do we want a little five-minute break, or should we keep going? Are people... How's our stamina? Stamina's good? Okay. Okay, so let's just talk about the generators. We kind of covered the different aura types. Now, for the generators, we want to talk about strategy and authority. And the strategy of the generator, as most of you will know, is to wait to respond. The authority of the generator can either be the sacral authority or the emotional authority. And they work a little bit differently. But those are the only two authorities that a generator, manifesting generator, can have. Uh, Either way, they're waiting to respond. Now, we do say that the manifesting generator waits to respond and then informs. So there is a little bit of the manifester in there. Uh, I've heard that. Um, Sometimes these nuances can help people to understand what's going on. Sometimes they can hinder. You know, it's... To me, I don't like to argue over whether a manifesting generator really does have to inform or, you know, the whole question of really this or really that. To me, the question is more about what can bring someone to the experience that teaches them. Mm -hmm. Because the words do not teach them, the experience teaches them. Mm -hmm. And what can bring them to that experience, if they're stuck on one idea and they can't get around it, try something different. So if it's a manifesting generator who's really stuck and they're going, you know, I've been waiting to respond, but it just doesn't seem to work for me, um, maybe you talk to them more about the informing aspect of it. Or if they're stuck on that, or they're saying, well, like a manifester, I have to inform. Look, I'm telling you, I'm going to go do this now. I'm going to go do that now. And they're not really, they haven't really understood the, the responding part of it. I mean, either way, responding comes first. Informing is not actually a mechanical uh, strategy. It's simply good advice. One should inform. Sorry, Mark Germain, we are going to use the should word here. Uh, I'm a fifth line, and fifth lines are the great shoulders, because, uh, you know, the fifth line is the one who calls, and the second line, and this is a little bit technical for those who have a study profile, but the second line is here to be called. And so the second line goes through their whole life. You should do this. You should do that. You should have this done. You should have that. You are a second line. You are a two-four. Do we have any other second lines here? Oh, yeah, two-four, of course, yeah. And so... The, the second lines are constantly, you know, you should try this, you should go there, you should check this out, you should. It just attracts that from people. But all of us uh, can, I mean, most of us anyway have at least one second line. Some people don't. It's very rare, um, but some people don't have any second lines. But in any case, regardless of the should, I don't want to get, get too caught up in that, uh, informing is not a mechanical strategy. Responding is. Invitation is waiting for the lunar cycle, which is the strategy of, of the reflector. That's mechanical, you know, the like clockwork, every lunar cycle, every single hanging gate they have, all 26 activations 
um, which doesn't mean 26 hanging gates, it could be less if you have multiple activations in the same gate, but in any case, all their hanging gates mechanically get activated, like clockwork. So these are mechanisms. Response is a mechanism. Informing is not. It's just good advice. Mm. You should inform if you don't want to get resistance, if you're going to do something that's going to impact people. You know, you should inform them. If it's going to have an impact, if it's going to disrupt them, if it's going to interrupt them, you might as well inform. It will eliminate resistance. People tend to think um, informing, I've heard manifestors say, you know, it's, it's none of their business, or, you know, how come I would tell them? I one manifestor say, I don't know what informing really means. And I said, well, if you're going to do some work on your house, tell your neighbors as early as you make the plan, as soon as you make the plan, even if it's a month out, Tell them as early as possible, as soon as you know anything that's going to impact them in the slightest. Mm. And the response was, that's none of their business. <laughs> well, why don't you tell them? It'll just decrease resistance. No, they might get in my way then. They might mm. talk to the city or they might be snooping around or I value my privacy. I don't want them to know what I'm doing, all this stuff. You know, They might try to make me have a permit, You know, whatever it is. Um, no, it actually works the other way around. When manifestors inform, they eliminate resistance. But that's something you can't convince them of. They can only convince themselves of when they actually get curious enough to try it. Mm. Or desperate enough, which is <laughs> usually the case. <laughs> so the manifesting generator, yeah, experiment with informing as soon as, you know. But the, the response is what it's really about. Now, if you're emotional, you also have to wait for emotional clarity. And this goes for any emotional type, projectors, manifestors, generators. So that emotional clarity is going to be, you may have a strong response to something, but you still can't make that decision until you wait long enough for your emotional system to become clear that that is the right decision to make. Uh, now, I've heard... I've heard generators say a lot of different things about responding. There's a lot of ideas around what it really means and this or that. My litmus test for is it response or is it something you can respond to? Is there a decision to make? It's at the moment of making the decision. Do you want to buy this car? People like Mark Germain, I don't know why I'm picking on him today, but we just had a, we had a reading with him, we had a little conversation with him last week. He was saying, well, if you, you know, don't ask a generator what they want, to ask if it's correct for them. Because they might get a response, uh-huh, I want this, is it correct for you? Uh -huh. No, it's not. Mm. I disagree. Mm. What I think is it doesn't really matter what words, what matters is the decision. Mm. Are you buying this car? Mm -hmm. Are you signing your name on the dotted line and paying me money? Mm. Uh-huh, okay, you're going to pay me the money for the car? Okay, it doesn't matter if you want the car, if you need the car, if it's correct for you to have the car. Mm -hmm. Are you making the decision? Mm. And sure, a different language can elicit different responses. Mm -hmm. Details can elicit a response where there was no response before. You go into this party, yeah, I don't know. Well, if this so-and-so is going to be there, mm, I'm going to go to that now. You know, I want to see that. You know? <laughs> Details do make a difference. But it's ultimately, when people ask, is it something I can respond to or not? Or is it, you know, is it a response if this happened or that happened? Are you making a decision? And is that decision binding? Not a mental decision that you can get out of where you say, I think I should do that. Yeah, but then the next day, I'm not going to do that. No, is it binding? Like, are you signing your name on the dotted line? Like, are you turning left rather than right? You know, are you doing this or not? Mm -hmm. um, now, manifesting generators, I have heard, I'm not one, so I don't know this, but it seems like they have a little bit more wiggle room to get out of things where they respond that they're going to do something and then they run into something that allows them to basically interrupt or change. Maybe that's the manifesting aspect and change courses. I've heard this is the case. I don't know that this is the case. I, I don't manifesting generated. It's the case. What's that? I know several manifesting generators. Well, I know they do that. Yeah. I just don't know if that's correct for them because they oh. could just be initiating. Because again, you have to remember that people who haven't experimented typically for years with deconditioning from their urge to constantly initiate are going to be spinning their wheels in circles, ending up years later back where they started because they, they can't stay the course. Every time you initiate, mm. it interrupts the flow and it has to wait to start over from the beginning. Mm. So, you know, I've also heard that manifesting generators are multitaskers. I don't believe it. I don't think anyone's a multitasker. They might rapidly change from one task to another and they might have a lower context switching cost. Mm. Even that remains to be seen. How I understand it is that when you wait to respond, you can't initiate quitting. You can't initiate getting out of anything. You can't initiate 
anything. So you essentially continue going in the direction you're going until something new comes along for you to respond to. When you do that, you continue to get to new places. You know, how people talk about how they've had the same relationship or the same relationship problem mm -hmm. again and again, or they end up in the same going in circles in their life again and again. That's because they're initiating because they think, oh, I'm hitting the same problem. I better get out of it. So they initiate out of it, they end up in the same problem again. Yeah. Oh, again, I can't, I'm going to initiate out of it. And, you know, the, the real, the cruel thing for the generator is they, they can't mentally decide to even stay in something. They have to have responded in the first place because then they otherwise don't have the energy to persevere through it. They only have the energy to persevere when it came from a genuine response. So when a generator is asked, do you want to go on this trip? And they go, uh-huh. And then they go on that trip. Or sometimes manifesting generators won't use words. They'll just use actions. They go, yeah, I'll think about it. And then they see themselves packing or something like that. You know, they've just kind of surrendered to allowing them themselves full control over what they're actually doing, even if their mind is going, what are you doing? You know, um, But typically for a generator anyway, there will be a sound. And so when the generator, you want to go on this trip? Uh-huh. Well, when that happens, then they go on the trip and it gets difficult, but... They don't, they have the energy to keep going. Whereas if they initiated, hey guys, I'm going on this trip, they're gonna cut it short. I've seen two generators go on international trips, cut the trip short and have to pay thousands of dollars extra to come back early in a pit of frustration. In both of those cases, nobody asked them if they wanted to go. And even if they did, they would have said, yeah, of course I want to go. What are you talking about? Because that, yes, of course I want to do that is the mental, you're here now. the mental, you know, words. I remember I was, um, getting uh, a friend into human design trying to kind of corrupt him with it trying to get the logic virus in and he was because he was just so frustrated and complaining and saying you know he's telling me example after example where he had agreed to do things he didn't want to do he wanted to see this amazing glass blower that uh, was visiting from Czech Republic who did this exact style of glass blowing that he had studied mm -hmm. and that he wanted to do and instead he was asked he wanted to go hiking and he said, yeah, sure, I'll go hiking instead of going to my favorite glass blower thing. Well, then he ended up extremely frustrated. So I was telling him, he's like, how do I get out of that? And of course, he has undefined solar plexus, which is afraid of confronting, afraid of disappointing people, afraid of letting down their expectations, afraid of hurting their feelings, afraid of, you know, all of that. And I said, well, uh, what, give me an example of something else you're doing. He's like, well, I'm supposed to go get this couch tomorrow, but it's a two-hour drive each day, and I don't want to do it. It's my only day off in 10 days, and I, I don't want to do it. And I just said, well, you can't initiate by saying, I don't want to go tomorrow. You just can't. But wait until you're asked, because your aura will eventually elicit the question. Mm. And when you're asked, you might surprise yourself and you might really want to go. You might go, uh, -huh, let's do it. Or you might go, uh, -huh. and that's just all it takes. Because if you tell somebody, I don't want to go, they actually will be hurt. But if you go, uh, uh. Nothing can argue with that uh if it's authentic. Mm. If you planned the uh, uh ahead of time and you like rehearsed it, you know, <laughs> so you have to really in the moment be prepared to see what you're going to do. Because you might actually go, uh-huh, let's do it. You might have actually resolved we're getting this couch, you know. You don't know that, right? You might only think you want the day off, and you might actually want to go get this couch. So I told him all this. His his girlfriend comes in, they're hanging out, two hours go by, we're all laughing. They're about to leave, she goes, Hey, so tomorrow we're going to go get that, you want to get that couch? She goes, ah! <laughs> she, 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 like, she was like shocked. She was like, she was like um, I thought we were going to get it. And he goes, yeah, um, I, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> he just had to like backpedal. She goes, I want that couch, you know, we got to get it. And I, I think he ended up getting the couch. But anyway, <laughs> the next part of the experiment is actually following through with what yes. you witnessed yourself responding to. But I mean, I liken it to uh, you're walking down the street, somebody's walking towards you, and you can't plan ahead of time to say hello, mm -hmm. and you can't plan ahead of time to not say hello. It's just when you get a when you actually get an aura, you're either going to acknowledge them or you're not. And you don't know until it happens. But if you plan ahead of time and then you go, hi, you know, it's really awkward, right? If you're a generator and you walk into the room and you go, hey, everybody, like, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard. Like, you, this is not the way of the generator. You know, the way of the generator is to wait to respond. If you have an undefined throat, especially so. If you have an undefined throat as a generator, uh, don't be the first one to talk. And you have two undefined throat people deep in the experiment and they're just sitting in silence until something happens. I mean, that, that's the way it works. I mean, you can have 
um, I had an hour sitting acknowledging but not really talking with with a uh, generator friend until finally, usually you know something happens and you see a bird and you go oh or something you go, oh there's a bird yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> something like that but I mean if you really are comfortable in your silence and in your waiting to respond you'll walk up to the barista and they'll be busy on their phone or something and you'll wait even if it's a minute who cares and then when they notice you they go oh sorry I didn't see you there. And uh, and then you're actually off to a good start. But if you go, <clears throat> you know, they, they hate you forever. They will never be your friends. So. All right. I think that's it for generators today. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Yeah. Any open, uh, open questions, comments? Any, uh, do you have a question? Um, no. Uh, okay. And there we go. Do you have a question? <laughs> Give people a chance to respond. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> Let's see. Like, that's, uh, uh, that's nothing really there. You have a question? <laughs> you're welcome to comment, Mike. Um, the, the explicit soliciting a response by asking the people directly, isn't that also true that the more you get in touch with the mechanics of response, the subtler things you can respond to and people want to jump the gun on that and they want, and they want to be like, Oh, I'm responding to the cloud passing over the sun, which tells me it's time to go on a picnic. But most of the time that's going to be initiating a picnic, right? Yeah. But mm. I do think it can get that subtle if you really know what you're doing. If that moment is really happening and something as subtle as a cloud is passing and that response is really coming up and it's directly related to what that cloud is inspiring, I think that can be really real. But, you know, it takes a lot of familiarity with your own body. Like you said, you can't just, like, study the, this through language. You have to notice it, note it become so familiar with how it happens, that all that chemistry is there and visible to you in the moment. Mm -hmm. That's that answer my question. Yeah, yeah. yeah mine too. <laughs> <laughs> that just made me think about something, and now I do have a question. What's the question? <laughs> so I was thinking of, as a manifesting generator, I was thinking about what you said about how you're just moving in the direction that you're going in um, until there's, you didn't say it like this, but until there's something else to respond to. Uh, like you can't initiate quitting, yeah. Right, which is an interesting thing. Maybe to think MGs about. can though. I mean, that's maybe the manifesting part of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a generator, so I can say for me, I get totally stuck in conversations where I can't initiate getting out of that conversation. I've seen manifesting generators say, "Hey, I gotta go over here now," and kind of break uh, it in a way that I can't, and that could be the manifesting side of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I had something happen this week that I'm still sort of like looking at. Like I was supposed to be away on this vacation that I paid for in January. And then like a couple days before I was gonna leave, Airbnb canceled it, changing the management, I don't know, like I didn't have time to look at it right then. And then all of a sudden my gut was like, ah, oh, oh, that's some fishy shit. I don't know what's going on there. Yeah. You know, and then I sort of like sat with it for a little while and then I was just like, uh-uh, I don't know, I don't know what that is, but like, we're not doing it. And I was like, I was all psyched to do this thing. And then all of a sudden it was like not cool but that's because it was like an interruption. Like everything was cool. I was supposed to be planning. And then it was like, oh, now you don't have a reservation. It was like, well, I'm not going to start packing. So now I have yeah. this new Well, and that, and that may also, I mean, this is what I've heard about manifesting generators is that they can start something and then they can kind of stop it and leave it unfinished and go on to the next thing. Well, only because something new came along. Sure. Like that's what people say all the time about like, not finishing projects and as someone with a defined will center like i don't know dude if i told you i was gonna do it it's fucking happening yeah but i do lose interest with things for myself but it's only because something cooler just arrived that has yeah. my attention mm -hmm. right now totally mm -hmm. totally i mean i think i think generators and manifesting generators both probably experience it to varying degrees generators get stuck in things a lot longer where even to their detriment I mean, it eventually works out, but I think a generator often will have one thing after the next, after the next, after the next come up, and will just keep going through it, mm -hmm. and no matter how many times mm -hmm. things stop, or it was canceled, or this is a difficulty, or that's a difficulty, or they had layovers, or they had, and they just keep pushing through it. Like, great example was I went to visit uh, Awokanand Diaz, and it was nothing but problems. And so you would kind of, some people might say, well, um, isn't that life telling you to just give up that you shouldn't persevere through that because, you know, aren't you initiating by having to kind of go against the flow of life? Isn't the generator the path of least resistance? Well, my path of least resistance was 
I don't have anything else to do at that time. It's, it takes more energy for me to try to think of something else or try to, I mean, that, that would be initiating. Like, well, I guess I'm not going to do this. Like, I was in London. Mm-hmm. I was going to Ibiza. One thing after the next was a problem. Instead, it just took me two and a half days extra mm-hmm. of traveling and missing this and missing that and having tons of resistance. I was also with someone who compromised my 2946, I think. But anyway, um, mm-hmm. you know, but sometimes you have to trudge through the mud. Mm-hmm. The generator, I think, has to trudge through the mud. It seems to me that manifesting generators get more opportunity to use their manifesting channel mm-hmm. to, to kind of initiate a way out of the mud into something else. Mm-hmm. And this is probably also the skipping steps. They probably end up in the same place anyway. Like you'll probably end up going to that place. You'll just end up going there under the right conditions for you. Um, I mean, we just have different tools at our disposal. I don't really have the tool of interrupting. If I talk to somebody, if I meet somebody at a party, first of all, I sit around and with my kind of generator aura, they approach me. Mm-hmm. Or I, I, they have their generator and I approach them because we're both drawn to each other. Mm-hmm. We just kind of sit down next to each other. I noticed that just the other night actually dancing. I'm sure that person was a generator. There's one person totally unintentionally I just kept ending up next to. <laughs> and she ended up next to me. And we'd be like, oh, you again. Like we're in this big uh, room yeah. where we just end up next to each other again and again. It's like, oh, what are you doing? And two hours later, oh, here, it's you again, you know. Mm-hmm. And we just kind of keep hanging out around each other. And, of course, didn't talk, didn't initiate. I'm not going to say, hey, good music, huh? You know, <laughs> that's the initiating, right? So I didn't. I didn't initiate. But we end up just kind of in that same zone. What ends up happening, and I experienced this when I was really experimenting with it. Oh, and I, I do want to tell one last story about my first, kind of, I, I said I would. Yeah. I have an undefined ego, so I don't do most of the things. I just try not to say I will do anything. That's my <laughs> story. Yeah. But, uh, but I just, just remember, just so I, I should cover that um but in any case uh you know i'll be at a party and we'll be talking and it'll be fully responsive where they're talking and i'm talking and i'm listening and they're talking and they're listening and we're back and forth and if i say hey do you want to go for a walk kills the vibe completely destroys everything not even i'm not even talking romance guy girl anything doesn't matter just if i say hey let's go do this now that's the initiating that just completely interrupts Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And suddenly, and like they can maybe, maybe if we have enough responsive flow, it can like contain that to where they, we can kind of pick back up the flow. But a lot of times it just breaks the spell and suddenly this, this kind of spell we were in. Now, if it's last call, people say, hey, here we get out of here. It's like, oh, you want to go for a walk now? Then that's the perfect timing. Mm-hmm. Waited for the right timing for something to happen to then, not even initiating, it's just, oh, we got to leave. Let's go do this now. Let's keep the party going somewhere else, you know. Um, but I've noticed that manifesting generators, it's like once they have that responsive thing, once they have responded, can say, you know what, this lighting sucks. Let's turn down the lights. And it's totally fine. It's like yeah. really smooth. Mm-hmm. And they're able to just kind of, you know what, it's really uncomfortable here. Let's go sit over there. Like they just have the ability fluidly to direct things the way a manifester would mm-hmm. um, without really breaking that responsive flow. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that your experience? Have you had that at all? or to a That definitely resonates for me, I think, yeah. But that, to me, it, that sounds like a response thing. And we're fast like that. So we can catch it fast. Whereas yeah. other people, only like later, they'll be like, it's fucking bright and shit. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. But like, it we is. It's, well, it's response, but then it's initiating in the way that I've seen manifestors go and just start changing all the lights and uh-huh. change the music and do everything, you know. <laughs> so they just, they just don't inform and just, just start changing everything. Okay. And, but, but anyway, um, so just very shortly, the story, this was about a year into my human design experiment. And I thought, I really want to start getting more human design things in my belt, but how do I do this without initiating? So what I did was I brought this little folding table. You might say, oh, that's initiating. I mean, people get people love to split hairs. It's not. Because I looked at that table, I was like, oh, yeah. But that's an awesome table. Like, oh, like, I, I bought that table out of response. Like, it has, it's like grass and wood, and it folds out. And it's like a really nice, like, it's like a portable, like, cartographer's table or something. Cool. It like folds into a suitcase. It's like, that's a fucking cool table. So, you know, I was all about the table. And I just put some human design books in there, and I had some printouts. And I just thought, well, I'll just bring this table to the party, see what happens. So I bring it, I leave it there. I hung out all night long. I forgot I was even going to do human design readings. I got there at 7 or 8. It was midnight. And I was like, oh, shit, the table. So then I see this table, and I just take it down to the basement of the party. As I'm going down, I was so deep in my, like, I'm not going to initiate. Someone's like, what's that? I'm like, 
It's a folding table. You know, what, are you, what are you doing with that? I'm going downstairs. Okay, cool. So I just like, I wasn't, I wasn't like, I'm not about to give them any, you know, any, yeah. any clue. So I go and sit down there and I just unfold the table. I'm just sitting there at the table and just like reading, literally. And a few minutes later, the person comes down and says, what's this all about? And say, oh, I'm doing, uh, this is for human design. What's human design? Oh, it's a system I'm getting into. <laughs> You know, well, what what do you do with it? Well, you can look at this thing called a body graph. Here's an example. Could you tell me about mine? Sure. What do you want to know? I was like, well, what can you tell me? So we start talking to them. Five minutes later, they go up, and then another person comes down, another person. You know where this is going. This was actually the party before we did the aura experiment party where everybody got their, uh, their like, laminated charts. At this party, I did readings until 6 a.m. I oh. could not leave. It was, the, I at one point had 10 or 15 people sitting around in a circle hearing these people were bringing, a girl was bringing her boyfriend, you got to get the reading from them. He's like, yeah, star. I'm like, this guy does not want a reading. You know, I, you know what I told him? I told him, uh, you're basically a Kali Shiva destroyer spirit here, uh, here to just blow away everything old and useless. He was like, yeah, you really are like here to have an impact, man. And that's what I tell manifestors. I know how to kind of puff them up a little bit because they're not interested in any of the flowery stuff. But, uh, but yeah, I mean that is that was the first real um, encouragement that I got for doing readings, and it wasn't from putting an ad in the paper. It wasn't from telling my friends. I mean, I do like to say you can inform people. Like you, you I do think it's totally valid to say, hey, I, I want to start doing readings, and some, you know, but don't just go inform a stranger. Hey, hey, I'm doing these readings. I mean, that's gonna be that's gonna be you're gonna ruin the chance although at the same time like i was saying earlier it all funnels the same place so even if you do you completely you know annoy them by doing that it still works it still ends up at the same place because what they actually like is your energy if they like your energy and no amount of not initiating is going to make them like your energy if they don't um however i will say having sort of energy hygiene sleeping alone uh, giving up when you're kind of barking up the wrong tree, stuff like that, does go a long way. Yeah, Let the aura do the talking. Yeah. I do have a question. Yes. If you're finished with mm -hmm. that little stream of thought. Sure. If you initiate as a generator or generator of manifesting ability and you are initiated incorrectly or when it entered something incorrectly, sure. Um, do you just stay that track and trudge through it? I don't think it's possible because I think or, uh, the universe I don't think, is I don't think there's going to fall apart. It. I think there's not enough energy. I think what really ends up happening is you missed the bus, but you can wait for the next bus. Mm -hmm. Well, like I'm that. just curious. Uh, yeah, because what really happens is it's opportunity cost. When you initiate, you miss what would have come a moment later if you didn't initiate. <laughs> and so now you have to wait for it to come back around to catch it the next time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's really just about creating enough space in your life. Um, and, I, you know, I think uh, if, if you're in something that really sucks, I mean, obviously, if you're on a trip that you hate and you initiated going into that trip, well, I guess it is a good question. Do you initiate again to get out of the trip or do you just kind of tough it out? Right. MGs may have an easier time of getting out of it. Right. It's my hunch that generators get a lot more stuck in things yeah. because <laughs> the MG has this manifesting potential where they don't have to wait as long to find a way out, you know, or maybe they even just catch it, like you're saying. They're so quick. Well, it's still really distracted. Like, there's not <laughs> enough energy to do all the things. Yeah, yeah. So, but that's, but that's the advantage of that is then you have the quickness to, to find a way to get out of that situation. Whereas, as a generator, if I made a really bad decision and I'm stuck in it, and if, say I, I went on a trip for two weeks, my flight isn't for two weeks, do I just tough it out? Really, it's a path of least resistance question. Is it going to require a lot more initiating to change all my plane tickets to get out of it? Mm, right. Or <laughs> if, is it going to require, is it like, right. it, it, basically, where is the flow going? And if I'm being pushed in a certain direction, but see, I'm a pure generator, so I don't really have that same manifesting ability. I mean, I can temporarily have it when the transits or somebody else, right. you know, I can hop a ride with them. Right. You know, and MG's like, hey man, let's get out of here. Let's just get a car and just go. I was like, okay, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> I can, I can uh-huh to that, but I can't sit there and be like, well, I guess I better call up the car place and go cancel all these plans and go do that uh, now. Right. Like, it doesn't right. really, when things are set in motion, I tend to kind of just ride them out until their ultimate fruition. Yeah. No matter how bad it is. Yeah. Can you give an example of the difference between the waiting, um, waiting to or not initiating for generators and 
That's what generators yeah. are, right? And and for projectors, waiting for the invitations. Yeah, waiting for invitations. Yeah, let's get a little. That was my question too. Good, good, good oh yeah, <laughs> wonderful. Well, I think Five one. Of, <laughs> <laughs> so I think one of the uh, I think one of the things is going to be that generators are. It's really about time, timing, and so generators are so much more moment to moment to moment. Even if they're solar plexus and have to wait for clarity, there's an opportunity to get satisfaction in every moment of frustration. Like you can have like the deepest frustration and then it breaks through to the greatest satisfaction. Yeah. Projectors and their mechanic of success or bitterness is a very long, slow buildup. And they don't just get bitter overnight and they don't just get sweet overnight either. I mean, um, I have a, a you know, projector friend I know who moved to New York, uh, came back to Seattle, 15 years later, very bitter. He was in the music industry for 15 years. He's not just, even if he got into human design, it's going to take 15 years to get unbitter. You know, he's not going to sweeten up overnight. And the way that a generator can be so frustrated and then can just reach the pinnacles of satisfaction at any moment. Yeah. There's just such a potential there. So the invitation, yeah, there's going to be small invitations. There's going to be a sort of a texture to life, but... The projector is really here for those major life decisions, relationship, job, or you know, vocation. Because even though projectors aren't here to work, they are here to have jobs. You know, what is your job, and, and you know what it is you're doing, and so on. Um, and place that you live, and really, and, and the kind of people in your life, because place and people are very intricately intertwined. And so those three things, and I'm, I'm sure you might have a, a comment on this. The question was the difference between waiting for the invitation versus waiting for response. I was saying it's um, it's like zooming out of the timeline. You zoom in and you see the generator day to day to day. You zoom out and you see the projector year to year to year. Mm -hmm. That it's a very bigger, bigger timeline because projectors can get stuck in things. Really, all of us can get stuck in things for seven years. There's a sort of a seven year um, cycle, which is a natural cellular uh, you know, regeneration process. And we tend, if we've, been romantically involved with someone, you never really get them out of your system for seven years. You know, if you meet somebody, anything that happens really takes seven years to fully process and so on. You kind of carry something of that person with you for seven years. Mm -hmm. um, but besides that, projectors are intimately connected to the seven year process where they really, it's like the stakes are so much higher. Yeah. Those stakes of what you allow yourself to be invited into. And it's really about relationship, job, and where you live. Those are going to be the three big ones. Um, something that Ra had said is that the equivalent for the projector of what the generator gets with their sacral response is what we call color transference. And, and that'll have to be a topic for a different uh, day. But we did talk about it a little bit in some of the Steve Rhodes material and substructure. Basically, we all have um, a color that is part of our design, and then we have a transferred color that we get pulled to, specifically by the wrong people. So these were um, fear, hope, desire, need, guilt, and innocence. I don't know if you remember which one yours was in that, but we can, we can save this for a future topic. But a projector who is desire, for example, they might be waiting years for the next invitation, but they can use the transference of desire to innocence as a signpost to be able to kind of tell in the day-to-day -day mm -hmm. texture as they're meeting people and as they're navigating and as they're going to lunch with somebody and going to a party with that person or getting to know someone and considering if they might be dating that person or what, what might happen or considering if they're going to go work at a job or not, things like that. Or even if they're already at the job, they might be there, but they can kind of witness who pulls them into their transference. A desire projector is going to have a very clear signpost because when they're really in their desire, they are going to be very involved and very actively engaged. And when they're in their innocence, someone's going to be saying, oh, that's not your problem. Don't even worry about it. Just leave it. Just stay out of it. Mm. It's kind of like, just be a bystander. Don't, don't get involved. Don't take sides. Don't be, you know, they're going to be kind of pulling that projector away from their true role, which is to um, be engaged. Yeah, to be engaged. On the other hand, if they're an innocence projector, 
they're really here to observe and witness and be that bystander. And people say, hey, you, you got to make a plan. You need a five-year plan. You know, you need to really, you know, what's what's next month look like for you? You need to really get off your ass and kind of, you know, and they're trying to like push them into having a desire agenda. That's going to be the wrong person for them. Mm -hmm. So for projectors, it is very different. The uh, Waiting for the invitation is a much longer term thing. And it's really all about cultivating yourself and becoming as... Uh, sharpening the sword, you know, becoming a, a, as much of a master as possible in the systems that you're really here to do. Um, on the relationship front, getting as good at communication and as good at relationships and not having emotional baggage and so on as you can. At the job front, getting as good at the systems as possible. On the environment front, basically learning as much about that environment as you can and, and, and really you know, there's things you can do while you're waiting. You're basically becoming more and more and more of a master or you're becoming more and more uh, of an expert in different ways. But because it's such a macro level thing, you can use color transference as the micro texture of the day-to-day -day interactions to see, mm -hmm. wow, who's really aligning me to who I really am and who's really pulling me, you know, away from myself mm -hmm. and kind of putting me in a role where I actually don't have anything to offer. So that's kind of the, the difference there. Cool. Yeah. So, so oftentimes, which I appreciate, you invite me to give swirls. Yes, the tarot swirl. You're a generator. Yes. So if a generator is, in a sense, inviting a projector, they're not initiating for themselves. They're initiating for somebody else. Is that a subtle point of difference or not? Well, it's kind of a response to your skill. Yeah, it's like it's, it's also her. you could say it's a response, but also I'm not making a huge decision in that regard. I mean, I guess you could say technically, Jonah, who asked you? Do you want to invite Ray? I mean, I mean, there is something that's fun, which is that generators who are deep in the experiment tend to double and triple check with each other. So I might say, Amy, let's go to a movie. You say. All right, I wouldn't even say that. I would say, do you want to go to a movie? You go, uh-huh, let's go. And then you would say to me, do you want to go to the movie? And I go, uh, actually, today is not the best. <laughs> you know? so, so there is this sort of nice double checking. Mike also is very good about triple checking with me a lot of times. They say, really? Are you sure? Do you want to do this? Are you there? You know? So there is a sort of, because it is true that a generator can just imagine something and then, hey, let's do it, and then not really know if they want to or not, mm -hmm. or know if they really have the energy or not. But it's uh, also the recognition invitation. There's a recognition of your mastery and skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's there's a libidinal investment as well, and you're so self sufficient that I know that if I turn you loose on a crowd of <laughs> hapless generators, you're going to change their life. <laughs> so it's very different. It's also it's kind of like as we sort of notice our investment of energy. I mean, there's so many different factors at play. Yes, I'm making a decision, but what decision is it? Am I buying a car, you know, or am I, am I, have I already made the decision ahead of time that I want to throw a really good party? Do you want your party to be awesome? Uh huh. Do you want it to be great? Uh huh. Do you want to have really cool people there? Uh huh. How do we do it? Oh, listen by Ray. I didn't like uh huh to Ray. I thought of it, but I thought of it because it's. How, it's my mind helping what my sacral has already decided. Mm -hmm. So the decision is to have a great party. I know that one of the factors of having a great party, it's like the mind can be in a support role of brainstorming and coming up with ideas for what might help something succeed. The decision's already been made. Mm. I'm going to be at that party either way. I'm going to be spending my energy either way. I'm going to be there from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. either way. It doesn't, there's no new decision. I'm not making a new decision to be somewhere else or go somewhere else or do something else. The decision already happened ahead of time. I'm just using my mind to brainstorm logistically because that's one of the things the mind is great at. It's great at logistics. Mm -hmm. It's great at, I mean, I have a fifth line personality. It's great at practical ways to make things really awesome. So, I mean, same thing for, I know I'm doing High Desert Human Design, September 13th to 17th, I hope everyone comes. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, at this point, the mind is just, how do I make this as amazing as possible? It's not making a new decision, because the decision has already been made to commit the sacred mm -hmm. energy. It's really that the decisions are about where what your energy is devoted to. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to be there anyway, and you think of, you know what would be really fun? It would be so fun to have a pinata. Get a fucking pinata. It's not like someone has to ask you, do you want a pinata for your party? I mean, that's nice if they check. 
if you say, you know what would be great? Let's get a pinata. They say, well, do you want a pinata? I was like, ah, oh, let's get a pinata. <laughs> then that's great. Okay. But it's not, it's not like that's an extra decision, really. I mean, that's like such a minor little decision on top mm-hmm. of. The big decision is where are you going to be, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and what are you going to be using your energy for? Mm-hmm. Is your energy available or not? If I'm already going to be there for the party, I know I'm going to be there one way or the other, I might as well logistically try to make it as fun as possible because I'm already responding to having a fun party. So, but if I'm not responding to the party and I, like my, my energy is elsewhere and it wants to get a bunch of work done, even though my mind is telling me, this is where I agree with Mark Germain and the shoulding, if my mind is like, you should relax and have a fun party. And I'm not really responding to that, and my mind is elsewhere, and my energy is elsewhere, then no matter what, I'm not going to have a good time, and I'm going to be distracted and pulled away from it because I didn't really have a sacral response to the party. It's like when a party is like, ah, I have too much work to do. I don't really have that energy right now. Ah, I can't really. I mean, I, I should have a party, yeah, but I can't because I have too much to do. And there are times when my sacral response is to, you know, cleaning my house rather than having a party or something like that. It's not just because we think. It sounds fun to have a party doesn't mean that that's that that's gonna that the sacral will have energy for that. Mm. So that's why it's important for the decisions of what we actually use our energy for. Uh, yeah. And a lot of the time, a generator will know what they want. They know they want to have a party or whatever, and they're like, "Well, I don't really get the opportunity to have this party from a place of response. What's up with that? I know I want this. Why isn't it? Why or I know I want to meet this person. Why aren't they walking up to me or whatever?" And the longer you hold that sacral urge, that sacral pull, the more it clarifies itself. And another thing the mind is doing is as it watches that thing that you want, that desire is clarified and that pull is clarified. And it might be that you you needed to wait longer because you want to have one kind of party, but you actually want to have a different kind of party. Or maybe mm. you just want to go to a party. Or maybe you just want to go dancing. Or maybe you actually want to be somewhere more anonymously. Yeah, like all these things can come into uh, light as, as you sustain the want to do it. And so that then when you have the opportunity to act for a response, it's cut the thing that happens comes in the form that you actually really want to happen instead of the images about what you think you want that you're throwing on top of. Yes. Yeah. Desire is good. And you know I mean you might think you have room for it and you really don't. I mean half the time a generator says, Why haven't I met the right person? And you look around their house and it's you're not ready. There's not there isn't space for another person. You look at their schedule and their calendar's full. I mean, it's kind of when you make space for it, and, and the, the longer you wait as a generator, the more you notice the things that you thought were ready and they're not actually ready. So you're like, oh, I thought two weeks ago I was ready, but actually I have two weeks to go before I'm ready. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it starts to dawn on you that the things that we think we're ready for and ready to do, we're not actually ready for. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. All right, any more, any more questions, final thoughts, parting? Who's the biggest initiator of the four different manifestors? Manifestors. That's the correct one. I thought you were saying here. <laughs> 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 oh, I, mean, I admit it. Call them. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. This is really good. Thank you. All right. Everybody. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's give us all a round of applause. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, all right. What are you doing next week? You know where that's um, I think it's, I don't know.